This is the Parenting IQ podcast where our mission is to equip you during your child's academic years to bring learning to the daily little moments. I'm your host, Dr. Kelly Cagle, and I want to welcome you to season four, Little Moments, Big Impacts. Hey, lifelong learners, let's talk about how to support your child as a student. And before we get going, I want to ask you for a huge favor. If you can subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening, and then also head over to the YouTube channel where you can watch all of these episodes and see what I look like, which is not going to be that appealing But go to the YouTube channel and subscribe there as well so you can get all of these videos face-to-face. But then you can also see some of the additional videos that will be coming really, really soon. So be on the lookout for that announcement for our YouTube channel. There's more coming, more teaching opportunities, and I'm super excited about that. But now let's get back to talking about how to support your child as a student. First of all, I want to say that one of the big things that I always think about whenever I look at a child as a whole is that they're really not a student. When you think of a student, he or she is going to school to learn. He or she thinks that or believes that their um, success is tied to their grades. And so they study and they study hard and they memorize information to then be able to turn around and take a test and ace a test. That's a student. A student is bound to the walls of a school. Now, a learner, on the other hand, is completely different. A learner is a a child, is a person really, who sees all the moments as learning opportunities, any environment, they can find something where they can learn, what they can learn about. They are also instead of just taking a test to ace a test, they actually look at the information and they think, man, how can I apply this information that I'm learning to the future or in my day-to-day or in my future career, just the opportunities beyond a paper, beyond just writing, memorizing information to take a test. So that, I always like bringing up that definition when I talk about your child as a student, because The lifelong learning message that we constantly talk about, that's really the motto that we're about is raising lifelong learners, is seeing life as school. So instead of just seeing the content in the classroom, it's more about the day-to-day. Now, what I do want to say when I talk about this is that teachers, whenever they are trained and they're in college, a really common theoretical framework that they look about or that they're they're taught about in college or in teaching certification programs is learning styles. You've probably heard of learning styles is there are four main one main ones and what this is about is ways to teach children to learn, okay? So the four learning styles are visual, auditory, read and write, and then kinesthetic. So let's unpack those a little bit. Kind of is self-explanatory, but maybe it's because I have a teaching background. But the visual one is for the students that learn by seeing. So they look at pages whenever they are reading. They're more interested in going to the pages first. They connect with the information whenever they can tie them to a picture or on the board If you remember, whenever you were taking a test in class, sometimes you would close your eyes and try to visualize the answer on the piece of paper when you study. Like, I remember it was on page 79. If I can just find the definition to this word, that's the question being asked on the test. You are likely a visual learner. You have the visual learning style because you can kind of visualize things in your mind. So you learn by seeing. The other one is auditory, and that's just learned by hearing. So the kids that sit there and just listen to the teacher and then can tell you everything that the teacher said, and you're like, oh my gosh, how do you remember? How do you remember all this stuff? Those are the children that learn by hearing. So a lot of times you'll see them not taking notes, and you're like, why aren't you taking notes? It's because they legit 
process the information or learn the information just by hearing. The other one is read and write. So you'll see the kids that can read the textbook and understand, or they can write the information and explain what is being taught. So the reading and the writing is how this this other learning style is about. And then the fourth one is kinesthetic. And those are the kids that learn by doing. And the hands-on activities, they love the labs and science whenever you get to that point. But here's what I wouldn't say. A really common disservice to kids in the general American classroom is that it's designed for order. Okay, of course, if you think of a classroom and you've got 38-year-olds, of course you want it to look orderly. You, that nobody, no person who is sane would be able to manage or would want to manage a classroom of 38-year-old chaotic kids, right? That's a no-brainer. But for that kinesthetic learning style, the kids that are very hands-on, what are they told to do the entire time during the classroom while the, the, you know, the teaching environment is to sit still, is to listen. The teacher is teaching and the student is sitting. So some of these learning styles are being, are being effective, right? So that the way that the teacher is delivering information is effective for those learning styles. But if you think about the kinesthetic, the child can get really antsy. And more importantly, the child isn't engaged in the learning, in the what's being taught, in receiving the information, in the ways that information is being delivered. Now, it's, It's hard because, again, the chaos is overwhelming for any sane person. I remember whenever I taught, and remember, I taught high school Spanish. So I had, I taught Spanish one. And so I had kids who were in mostly ninth and 10th grade, but then sometimes I had juniors. Sometimes I've even had seniors in my class before. And a lot of times for review for a test, I would do a bingo. I'm sorry, it was Jeopardy. And we played Jeopardy and it was trash can Jeopardy. And I would move all the desks. And so it was just this big open space in the classroom. And they could pick the whatever design I had on the board for Jeopardy. They would pick the question and I would tell tell them the question. If they got it right, they could throw a trash ball into the trash can. Like... It was madness. It was so chaotic and I could only handle it. By the end of the day, I was exhausted after playing my Jeopardy review game. But let me tell you something else. It was magical for the kids, especially those who were my kinesthetic learners. They were so engaged. A lot of times they couldn't answer the question, but I did them in groups. And so if they didn't know the answer, they could get together together and ask each other and kind of figure out what the answer was. And then they could, you know, give me the answer. But in those moments of chaos, for me, as the teacher, I saw such high engagement from my students that it made me want to do that more often. Now, granted, again, I'm not a, that was chaotic. It was madness. It was legit insanity for me by the end of every day. But what it did to my kids made it worthwhile because I wanted the information to stick. I didn't want them to just memorize the information for them to take a test and then go on about their day. But what what happens a lot of times is teachers are excited in the beginning of the year and they design, and I'm not blaming them here, y'all. Don't take it like this. Don't go and say, "My Dr. Kelly Cagle was talking about this on this podcast. You should listen to this episode. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying here is teachers get this sense of excitement in the beginning of, even sometimes even the beginning of the week. They design this, um, these amazing lessons that They want to to pursue and deliver to the kids where they know it'll be high engagement. But then there's discouragement that creeps in when kids are disengaged, 
when little feedback happens in the day to day or in their personal life, they have something happen and their energy tank is really low by the time they get to the classroom. And this is where you come in, parents. This isn't about what the teacher is doing in the classroom in their day to day. It's more about how you parent can support your child as a learner within the walls of your home, not leaving the teaching to just the teacher. Yes, you're not going to be teaching the content inside your home, but in a way that you can support your learner to practice these things at home. And I wrote a blog post that is called Three Ways to Support Your Child as a Student. So I took these three points and I want to talk to them or talk to you about them a little bit. You can read that blog on my website at drkellykagel.com under resources, the resources tab. And you can explore all the other blogs that I've written, some really good stuff to encourage you in your day-to-day with your child. But this one in particular, granted, you are not in the classroom, so you can't help what the teachers are going to do in regards to these three or the four learning styles. But what I do want to say is that you can come in and support your child as a learner within the walls of your home. And the very first one is speak life into their identity. A lot of times these kids that are kinesthetic, the kids that are busy, they get, it's frowned upon because they can be disruptive in a classroom environment. They can be interrupting to the learning environment. They can be annoying to the teacher who just wants to sit there and teach their other 29 students. Listen, I get it. I have been there. But if your child is that one, You can support them at home by really honing in on who they are and their identity instead of it always being about, why can't you sit still? Why are you being so disruptive? And why do you want so much attention? And all these other negative labels that can go along with that disruptive behavior. It's more about you coming in and saying, you are fearfully and wonderfully made by our creator Let's unpack a little bit ways, appropriate ways to behave in the classroom. Even though you have this much energy, here are some ways that you can come in and channel these energies, these bursts of energies in ways that won't disrupt the teacher, in ways that will actually support your learning and really will also support your entire classroom. So you coming in and speaking life over who they are, that they're perfect, just the way they are, and really just ways to control that energy. For example, if they sense those butterflies coming in and that burst of energy, I am like this. I feel these same things. So I can speak from personal experience in some ways that help me stay engaged. A lot of times I'll get up from my chair in my office and I will start moving around. And sometimes I do some push-ups on the ground Sometimes I do some like high knees. I run in place. I turn on my watch and I run in place for like two minutes because what happens is as I engage my body, I'm engaging my brain. So in order for me to have a focused brain, focused energy, I have to engage my body. My body is going to sleep if I sit for too long. That is exactly what is happening to your child in a classroom where they have to behave. They have to sit where it can look chaotic all the time. So giving them that strategy that, hey, when you feel this urge, this burst of energy, you can ask your teacher if you can sit in the back of the classroom, or you can even ask the teacher if you can run to the bathroom real quick. And as you're running to the bathroom, you are physically stretching your body. You're doing some jumping jacks, or you're stretching your arms, or you're skipping, not running, because we have to have walking feet, right? Otherwise, we can hurt ourselves in a school. It's not appropriate to run down the hall, but we can skip down the hall. We can move our arms down the hall. If the teacher is done teaching and is no longer disruptive, or it's okay for your student to get up and maybe do some stretches, even in place, this is empowering your child to advocate for their own needs is where they understand themselves enough to say, Hey, this is what's going to help me stay engaged. My brain engaged in this moment. So here are some ways that I can do that. The second thing that you can do is think about your definition of success. What message are you sending to your kids 
that, hey, you have to be a straight A student. If you are anything but a straight A student, it's not good enough. That definition of success, technically their grades really only matter for a season in their lives. Parents always try to bring up the fact that, yeah, but they need high grades to get into certain colleges. And these expectations are placed, these unrealistic expectations sometimes can be placed on the fact that kids just have to perform. And that's what's tied to success. And if the kids don't live up to that definition of success, they feel like failures. They feel like they're not good enough. And it's this domino effect of inferiority, of self-doubt, of fears, of anxieties that start boiling up just because you didn't even realize the pressure you were putting on them. This also follows through in sports. This follows through in relationships. This follows through in chores. What are what expectation are you placing on them? What standard are you holding them to in regards to success? Be a little flexible. Let First of all, remember that they are kids and our primary job as parents is to teach, is to mold, is to guide, is to shape. It's not to shame. It's not to place shame, uh, like unrealistic things that make them feel less than that they can't live up to what we're asking them to be. It's about talking things through and analyzing how you define success, the pressure you're putting on them. And then the third one that I wrote about in that blog is for you to be present, for you to help your child. And even though it may take time from your day, your time may be cooking or cleaning up the kitchen, for you to sit with your child and help them with their homework, you're going to learn so much about them instead of you just talking, okay, it's time for you to get in with your homework. Go do your homework, go study, you have a test. Instead of it being so, so directive, of you just telling them what to do, say, hey, can we go ahead and start doing your homework? I would love to sit with you and see what you're learning. Can is that Would that be okay? And then you can teach me. A lot of times, kids that are given the opportunity to even teach you, to tell you what it is that they're learning in class, that will take the information from their brains down to their heart. I'm not talking about the eight multiple intelligence theory here just yet in this episode because I'm going to do another episode. It'll probably be a series where I teach on these eight intelligences and how we can apply them to life and to career. But what I do want to say is that some kids really do learn by teaching others. And this is part of that kinesthetic. Bust out a a dry erase board, bust out a chalkboard get a piece of paper, let them doodle, let them show you these things. You have no idea the power and the magic that can happen when you just sit with your child and you engage in what they are learning. That curiosity shows them, wow, my parents actually really do care about what I'm learning. I want to make sure that I can tell them the right information just from you, mom and dad, showing an interest and being present in your kid's life, in their academic life too. So that's what I want to say today, guys, is those three things. Speak life into their identity. Think about your definition of success and be present as you you support your child as a student, as a learner. That redefining of, is my child a student? Does my child really just see that the school is the only place where they can learn? Or are they willing to bring this learning into life? Are they really, am I displaying this attitude of a long long life, life, I'm sorry, lifelong learner? It takes all of us. It takes the entire family to come together to speak life and to speak identity into being a lifelong learner. Starts with you, mom and dad, leading by example, being engaged, being present, and speaking life over who they are as perfect, wonderfully, fearfully, and wonderfully created by our God in heaven. So when they start doubting themselves, you come in as a student. If they're failing a class, get in there, do the dirty work with them. Think about their different learning styles. Well, does my child just sit here and look at pictures? If so, then you have them draw something out to you. If they're just 
learning by hearing, you can tell that when you give them information, they hear the instructions really well. Hmm. Maybe I can tell them, wow, instead of you trying to take notes next time, just try to listen to your teacher when she or he is teaching. Read and write, same thing. Apply this into your life. Be there with your child as they see, really, technically, a student is their job. Being a student is their job whenever they are young. So be there with them, be present. Lifelong learners, I hope that you feel more equipped today to bring learning to these daily moments as you see your child as a learner. We will see you next week.